Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of uh, Let's Talk About It. We will be um, talking to Dr. Samuel, um, today's edition of Cancer with Dr. Denise Ejo. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. About 10,000 cancer deaths um, were recorded in the are recorded yearly across the world. About 10,000 are from Nigeria. So where are we now? There's an increase in the percentage of people with lung cancer who are living longer after the diagnosis, partly because more people are being diagnosed at an early stage. So I want to welcome you all to this particular edition with Dr. Denise Ejo us on Let's um, Cancer. And in the house, we've got a specialist. Dr. Samuel is um, a consultant radiation and clinical oncologist. He is the chairman of the Nigerian Medical Association and the National Committee on Cancer. He's also a lecturer at the Federal University of Health Science, Utupu, Benue State. Welcome to this conversation and thank you for taking your time out to join us. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh... And to all our viewers, we're going to say sit down, relax. Get your pens if you want to get information. But also, at the end of it all, we will be sharing how you can also participate and get more information going forward. So, Dr. Samuel, I am now well and truly relaxed. And trust me, I have a lot of questions for you. All what right. is cancer and what is lung cancer? So, there's cancer. Yeah. So, general, general bam. Thank you. Yeah. So that it's actually two questions, and um, it's better you ask it that way because it's easier to understand the second part when you get to understand the first part better. Thank Cancer you. generally is a disease in which some cells in the body suddenly defy the natural checks and balances that have been placed to control everything about them. Maybe I should explain that. If you break down the human body into its smallest component, what you will get is called a cell. Now, the human body is made up of trillions upon trillions of cells, but every one of these cells seems to have a natural check and balance placed by nature that controls how, how large they grow, how fast they grow, how old they get to live before then, how many times they reach. And as such, it's so complicated that ordinarily, if you take a cell from one part of the body, let's say you take a cell from the lungs and transfer them to the liver, the cells in the liver will suddenly recognize this cell as, oh, this is a foreigner, it doesn't belong here, they gather together and they kill it. It's in the same body, but it's in, it's in a different part of the body. Now, that's how complicated and how well regulated the cells are in the body, as many in trillions as they are. Now, for some inexplicable reason, some particular cells suddenly gain an ability to defy these checks and balances placed by nature. So they grow older. In fact, they don't just grow old, they virtually become immortal. They, they gain an ability to grow and keep growing. They do not re respect that control with regards to size. So they can grow bigger and bigger to the point where they get to compress other normal cells around them and kill them. Now, the most funny aspect of them is the fact that they even gain an ability to move from the part where they started to any other part of the body. That is what we call metastasis. So they have, they gain an ability to metastasize to a different part of the body. So somebody could have a cancer that starts from the tip of the toe, and before you know it, they have metastasized to the brain or to the lungs or to the liver. And when they get there, the cells in this new environment do not see them as foreign. Instead, they see them like the landlords in that place right now. And as such, they seem to bow to them and give them everything they need. So they become, they begin to torment the cells in this new environment. Now, that is cancer. Any cell that suddenly, for an inexplicable reason, develops an ability to outgrow its normal level of growth, to sustain itself in a totally new environment, becomes a cancer cell. Now, cancer can occur from any part of the body, head to toe. As long as it's made up of living cells, it can develop into a cancer cell. So, when cancer cells develop from the lungs, we call that lung cancer. Just as if cancer cells develop from the breast, they will, call, they will be called breast cancer. If they develop from the stomach, it will be stomach cancer. So, they are classified basically 
from the site in which they originate. So lung cancer is cancer cells that originate primarily from the lungs. <laughs> Thank you for schooling us in the layman language. What Dr. Samuel has just explained is the first time I've heard the explanation of this <laughs> whole cancer thing in that way because I always got it in a slightly different way, but maybe a bit more technical. So now you've answered it and brought it to ordinary man English. Because I always knew that there was, we all have cells, because I always say to people, everybody has cancer cells. But yeah. it's whether they wake up or not makes it difference. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah. See, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm getting very schooled. I'm getting very, very schooled. And you answered the first two questions I had for you because you were then able to tell me the differences between how these cells work. So these normal cells and yeah. no normal cells. So thank you. You know, yeah. you went, you went there. So now the next question: What are the risk factors for lung cancer? Well, thank God you specified for lung cancer because usually. The risk factors for cancers depend on the exact cancer we are talking about. So for lung cancer, the most common risk factor is smoking, cigarette smoking. Now, um, for cancers, we don't usually talk about costs. We talk about risk factors. That is because irrespective of how much you think a particular factor is responsible for a cancer, you are likely to still find an individual who has that cancer that is not exposed to that factor at all. So when you call that factor a cause of the disease, you would be also labeling that individual who has developed that disease without getting exposed to that factor as having been somebody. So if we say smoking is a cause of lung cancer, then how do we explain about the five to 10% of individuals who develop lung cancer without ever being exposed to primary or secondary smoking? But the majority of patients who develop lung cancer, over 90%, 80 to 90% of them are individuals who have smoked for a very long time or at least have been exposed to what we call secondary smoking. That is an individual who has stayed in a place where others are smoking. How many packs of cigarette do you smoke in a day? And then you extrapolate that to how many packs of cigarette do you smoke in a year? Now, when we say 20 pack years, it's like saying somebody has smoked at least a pack of cigarette every day for 20 years. Now, it will differ if somebody smokes two packs of cigarettes, it means that person could make 20 pack years within 10 years. If somebody smokes four packs of cigarettes in a day, that person could make 20 pack years within four year, within five years. If that person smokes half a pack of cigarettes a day, it will take him 40 years thereabout to get 20 pack years. But if you do an extrapolation, you get an idea of what I'm talking about, that if an individual smokes on the average, one pack of cigarette a day for 20 years, the risk of lung cancer is quite significant. There are other factors, but these ones are now factors that majorly we, um, we, we do not have control over some of them. For instance, if somebody has a relative, a first degree relative who has, been ex who has developed lung cancer, it means that person also has a very high chance of developing lung cancer in their lifetime. But that is something we do not have um, control over. Now, there are a few other things that we might have some control over because they are environmental factors. For instance, there is radon gas. Radon is a radioactive kind of gas that is generated in the environment from the soil, from the water, from rocks around us. But it is radioactive. It comes from the natural breakdown of certain chemicals within our environment. And it could pile up, especially within homes where we live or within offices where we work. Radon gas could pile up. And it is radioactive and has the propensity to damage lungs and eventually lead to lung cancer. So there are different levels of radon based on the different environments in which we live. But if the level of radon within our environment is higher than acceptable, then our chances of developing lung cancer within that, within that environment becomes much higher. Asbestos is one of those um, um, products that used to be commonly used for our roofing, you know, as a form of um, insulator, you know, under our roofs. But right now, most asbestos have been phased out because it was realized that prolonged exposure to asbestos 
could lead to lung cancer. Um, so it has been phased out. So exposure to certain chemicals like asbestos, like cadmium, either from our place of work or from where we live, that is one. Exposure to gases, dangerous radioactive gases like radon is another factor. Well, um, I've talked about first, um, first, um, you know, first degree relatives, but the most important factor, which is actually within the control of most people, is cigarette smoking. You just said something, they didn't smoke. And I would yeah. say that if you check a lot of people that have had lung cancer or diagnosed with lung cancer as a primary, yeah. um, have actually felt very angry because they say, I didn't smoke, I don't smoke. Yeah. But now with your explanation, it helps us to see why um, the challenges can it be that way. Yeah. Okay, so my next yeah. question will go. In light of that, how does lung cancer present in patients? Yeah, um, it happens in the lungs, basically. So the most common feature is likely to be related to the lungs, um, and that is cough. For most people, it is a cough that starts suddenly and refuses to go away. Um, that is a very strong pointer. But for others, it progresses to things like not just the cough, but what we call hemoptysis, that is coughing and seeing blood in the sputum that is produced. Now, all of these are related to the lungs. Cough, hemoptysis, difficulty in breathing, all of that is related directly to the lungs. But in so many other people, let me just even start by saying that lung cancer presents without any symptom at all in the early stages. So for many people, and this accounts for why it tends to present late, because one could have lung cancer in the early stages and never get to know, would not even have a cough, would not even have a discomfort whatsoever. And for some, what they will just have is what we call constitutional symptoms they just feel some form of weakness that they do not understand they get easily fatigued they get um they, you know they just have a sense of being unwell all of that could be lung cancer and in many people that is how it comes and they do not show any signs whatsoever but when it becomes large enough when it becomes advanced enough to begin to bring out symptoms that's when we begin to talk about cough that's when we begin to talk about um hemoptysis that's bringing out um, blood in the sputum. Mm -hmm. And then we begin to talk about some difficulty in breathing. The person begins to have some difficulty breathing. They just feel either some pain when they breathe or they feel some, they just feel that the air is not going down there into the lungs the way it should. Now that is because of the lung cancer. But very importantly, it could also present as a feature for the first time of what I explained earlier, a metastasis. So we could just have a patient who suddenly has a headache because the disease has didn't even show any symptom at all in the lungs, but has reached the brain, could suddenly have a headache, could suddenly start convulsing, could suddenly lose consciousness, could suddenly have what we call a pathological fracture, what should not ideally break a bone, suddenly leads to you know a fracture because the bone has been affected by a metastatic cancer and um, is weaker than usual. So a slight pain that shouldn't cause a fracture causes a fracture. Or some significant pain in a distant site of the body, maybe in a bone or somewhere, and then we suddenly do some further work up and realize that, oh, this is a secondary disease. Where is the primary? Where did it start? Oh, we see something in the lungs and realize that that is where it started from. So it will start from primary, secondary, any of those parts. You highlighted a lot of things because one of the first things I was going to say was about the, there's a statement I always say, I say, cancer um, is an everyday illness. And a lot of people always ask me, what do you mean? I say, you can just have a cough and before you know it, that can be cancer. But, Thank you. And so Precisely. the truth is that anything that is persistent uh -huh. can be cancer. So just make sure exactly. you have any everyday persistence. Then you then highlighted, and I know you don't know me personally, so <laughs> it didn't make sense when you came up to the metastasis and you put the brain, because actually I'm going to now state I am I live with cancer as I said, but I have mm. breast cancer metastasizing in the brain, 
and all wow. the tumors are wow. in the brain they are not wow. in the in the they're not in the breast in the primary so, site yes yes they're not mm -hmm. in the primary site so now you see how you just explain something and i know you didn't know that so it's very interesting okay so now let's take this and let's take a break at this point and we'll come back to this very interesting conversation everyone um so let's just take a break and we'll come back again thank you welcome back everyone uh thank you for joining us on this uh, cancer with Dr. Denise Ejo. Gosh, we are having a fantastic discussion on lung cancer. And it's quite interesting because even for someone like me who lives with the disease, I am actually having to learn a lot that I knew, but I didn't know the meaning. So Dr. Samuel, we're really having a fantastic time. <laughs> yeah, can you talk us through the cancer treatment and its options? Okay, well, Maybe I will just say that there are about um, five, six treatments for cancer generally. The first and the easiest to think about is surgery. Now, surgery entails, like most people know, going in and um, using a knife in the theater to cut out the disease. Um, it's the oldest form of cancer treatment available. And ideally, it's supposed to be the um, it's supposed to be the treatment that offers the patients the highest chance of getting a cure. Now, apart from surgery, there is what we call radiotherapy. Now, with radiotherapy, what we try to do is to use ionizing radiation. This is radiation that has an ability to alter and kill cells. Focus this ionizing radiation on the cancer cells and kill them. I'm trying to be as simple as possible. Now, so we've talked about surgery, we've talked about radiotherapy. Now there is chemotherapy. I mentioned the basic characteristic of cancer cells being their ability to grow more rapidly than the normal cells. Now, because they come from within the individual, it's difficult to get something about them to target and kill. And uh, one of the things that is noticed about them that is very vital to them is their growth. So as they, as they grow and reproduce, there are certain chemicals they produce a lot. So when we give chemotherapy, what we do is to target those chemicals that they produce. So we are targeting their growth. We are trying to halt their growth. I am mentioning this because I will just digress for 10 seconds and say that is why chemotherapy seems to have a lot of side effects and those side effects seem to affect more of other cells that by nature are also rapidly growing because when you are targeting the cancer cells because they are growing rapidly you also realize that there are other cells like cells in the bone marrow like cells in the gut that are also by nature rapidly growing on a daily basis so they are like cancer cells but they are within the normal confines of nature so when you are attacking the cancer cancer cells growth, the chemotherapy also attacks these cells significantly. And that way, um, chemotherapy seems to have a lot of side effects like vomiting, like diarrhea, like, um, you know, the blood keeps going down because the chemotherapy affects all of these rapidly growing cells. So I've mentioned surgery, I've mentioned radiotherapy, I've mentioned chemotherapy. Now there is also what is called targeted therapy. Now this is a little bit more recent, and that is because um science has gone a little bit further to investigate a little bit more about the cancer cells themselves and try to find out something about them that makes them unique compared to every other cell within the body now whenever any such thing is found it becomes what is called a target and that target becomes what um, a drug or a chemical, a molecule is developed to specifically link onto and kill the cancer cells. Now, that way, targeted therapy has significantly less side effect because um, it is targeted to the cancer cell itself. Now, maybe a little bit technically, I'll talk about what we call stereotactic body irradiation. Now, it is a form of radiotherapy, just like I mentioned earlier. Yeah, but in this case, it happens with lung cancer cells that are very, very small. So instead of just irradiating the whole of the body or irradiating a large, large part of the lungs, lots of radiation sources are targeted all around that little tiny 
cancer cell and as such you have various radiation sources flashing radiation on a small point of the body at the same time you are able to get a very high dose of radiation to a very limited area of the lungs and that way kill we normally jokingly call it frying it's like frying or totally eradicating the cancer cell but that is because the cancer cell is very small and for some reason the patient is probably not fit to undergo surgery so stereotactic body irradiation could be used maybe the final modality i'll mention is what we call immunotherapy now i mentioned that cancer cells just seem to have a way of surviving within the body such that they could even move from one part of the other from one part of the body to the other how they do this is by um by evading finding ways of evading the body's normal immune res response system so what science is trying to do is to find ways of upregulating the body's immune system so they give what we call immunomod immunomod immunomodulators these immunomodulators tend to modulate the body's immune system upwards and make it easier for the body itself to fight against the cancer I'm going to say something again that's going to surprise you. I've been through Ouch. every single step you've mentioned. The current chemo I take is for life. So I take it mm. every day mm. for life. And apparently one of them is an immunotherapy. So you see, I still wow. have a bit of knowledge. Wow. So to those you of you, are, you, viewers are that are living, you are a living I am miracle. still looking all right, though. So you better don't give up. You better just know that you will continue to find You are a living miracle. Way. Honestly, I am a miracle. <laughs> ah, we thank God. So let's go on now. So wow. the next question I'm going Amen. to ask you. Hmm. So then, just give me two ways, no, three ways you can just confirm straight away that you guys, if somebody has cancer. Um. Well, I think I will just give you one. Because okay, one, that that's one fine. is primary. That one is primary to every other. You see, no matter, yeah. we, 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 we always say, no matter how it looks like a duck or quacks like a duck, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a duck. No matter how much um, the features look like lung cancer, the only real confirmation we could have that this is a lung cancer is when we get a tissue from the cancer itself and get to examine it under the microscope. Now, whether we do that by biopsy, by cutting open the lungs, what we call a thoracotomy, whether we do that by a media, a media, a media stenostomy, whether we, whatever thing we do, if we're able to access a part of the cancer tissue and then examine it under the microscope and see cancer cells with our eyes under the microscope and describe them with precision, that becomes the only time a lung cancer is actually confirmed. It could be as easy as getting some of the sputum the patient produces. If those, if the sputum contains cancer cells, if you examine it under the microscope, you would see the cancer cells. Now, because the diagnosis of cancer is one that can be so life-changing, we have to be as much as possible precise so that um, we, when you're telling a patient he has a cancer or she has a cancer, you should not have to come back tomorrow and say, oh, sorry, that was a mistake. It actually wasn't. So the only way you can be very sure you are talking about the cancer is when you get to see it, see the cells and describe the cells with your eyes. So um, the most precise diagnosis for cancer is almost always a biopsy so that we can Thank do you. a histological confirmation in the lab. Okay, yeah, now, so... Yeah. Please, can you just tell us, please, because this is one word that as non-medics, we all hear. Prognosis. Yeah. Prognosis okay. to a layman means um, you are telling us what the disease, what we have, the sickness. Prognosis <laughs> is actually saying, what do you expect as, an, as a possible outcome of the disease? That is prognosis. So with prognosis, we are actually saying, with this disease, how long does this patient have to live? What do we expect? Do we expect this patient to get cured? Do we expect this disease to be with this patient until the patient is no longer with us? Now, that's prognosis. You are trying to get an idea of the possible future outcome of the disease that sits 
in front of you. And that's one of the reasons why we stage cancers. All types of cancers are staged, either stage zero to stage four or sometimes stage five, because the stage at which the patient presents to the oncologist determines the prognosis, determines the possible outcome. So am I hoping that this disease can get cured? So let me be a little bit more radical in what I go about it, going all out against it because I know I can get, it, get rid this patient of this disease. Or has the disease gone so advanced that I am not, I know for certain that there is nothing I can do to really totally eradicate this disease. This patient will have to live with the disease. Now, those are decisions that the oncologist makes in the course of managing the patient. And that precisely is what we refer to as prognosis. Um, I have I've now gotten to understand the staging of cancer. And I I, okay. I want the public to really understand that the earlier you diag that you get a diagnosis, the better it is for you to to have good yeah. outcomes, and the outcomes Precisely. are variable. So if we wait, mm. because like I said, I have lost two people in a very short space of time, and both of them somewhere in the story there was lung cancer mentioned, and it's a shame mm. because it's to do with them. Um, wow. Um, metastasis and this word yeah. metastasis is another conversation for another day and I think I'm going to bring another it up day. because metastasis no is some understanding what metastasis means to a lot of people and how yeah. it, it helps so as we draw to the end of this dear viewers I want to thank you all for watching this program with us Dr. Samuel I want to really appreciate you for everything you've done for me today because honestly it's me and you that know how we've gone this journey but i want to really appreciate you and i look forward to My having pleasure. you back on to really talk um, about this cancer from a different perspective and as we go on i'd like to share with everyone you can follow us on commode cancer foundation we have a website which is um, um dot, dot org not dot com it's dot org we've got uh, mm. um a YouTube page, which is also Common Cancer Foundation NG, and these videos are there. There are over 50 videos that create awareness on different types of cancers, mm. and I would suggest Great. people to look out and find out, find information, because the more you know, the better you, the better chances you have of, you have of, yeah. of getting um, the help you need at the right time from the right source. Yeah. Understanding yeah. that there are less than 100 oncologists in Nigeria means always mm. find an oncologist not just a doctor an oncologist yeah. is who you need when you are going through the cancer journey and finally to everyone any questions you have you can go onto our instagram page our facebook page write questions send us share us your views and we will take it from there thank you for joining us and thank you, thank you um, plus much. tv for giving us this segment and thank you dr samuel um for My this um, afternoon we really appreciate you thank you very much My have pleasure. a lovely day thank you very much <laughs>